All right, I want to uh, welcome you all. I'm Joe Radner. I'm representing the program committee of the Charlotte Hobbs Memorial Library. And uh, tonight's program, I want to say, is sponsored by the Maine Humanities Council, the Maine Speaks program of the Maine Humanities Council. And we're delighted that they are providing us with this opportunity. Um, <clears throat> just a little bit of business before we start. We are recording this program. Um, if you would like to leave your camera on so that we can see your voice, your face as, as people talk, that would be lovely if you can, but you may be eating dinner or sitting there in your pajamas, which is perfectly fine. Um, if you would like to have closed captions to help you with hearing and seeing the program, at the bottom of your screen, you will see a, a thing that says live transcript. And you can click on that and, and, and enable a kind of simultaneous live transcript. Otherwise, you can ignore that. Um, and of course, if you've been doing Zoom for the last two years, like most of the United States, you know, but, you, but let me remind you that if you click on view in your upper right hand corner, you can choose to have either speaker view where you will see just the person who's speaking or gallery view where you will see the whole panoply of people here in our little boxes uh, as real people. Because this program is being uh, presented through the Maine Humanities Council, they would like us to ask you to do a little evaluation at the very end. It'll take you about a minute. So at the end of the program, I will put a link to the evaluation in the chat. And if you click on that as you go off, it'll take you maybe a minute. Um, they would appreciate your evaluation. Um, please keep your microphone muted during the program so that we don't have background noises. But at the very end, we will have a chance to discuss things. And if during the program a question comes to your mind, please write it into the chat and we'll use it at the end in the discussion. So I'm going to introduce our speaker. Louise Gullal Daining. Yeah. No joy, uh, I'll I'll say something first. I want to say oh. first that. Um, this evening, the Charlotte Hobbs Library in Lovell, Maine, is hosting an extraordinary event. Um, our library, as many of you know, stands on land that was occupied some 250 years ago by English settlers without permission or sale or treaty. Land that had been cherished by Wabanaki people for many thousands of years before that. And yet, despite the obvious intentions of my ancestors and their companions, Wabanaki people have survived and persisted through those long years of dispossession all over northern New England and Atlantic Canada. And this evening's speaker is someone who is doing powerful and important work to maintain and strengthen Wabanaki and specifically Penobscot culture. We are honored to welcome Carol Dana, who currently works as language resource person for the Cultural and Historic Preservation Department of the Penobscot Nation. And I am excited to tell you that just this month, the Maine Humanities Council has awarded Carol Dana the Constance H. Carlson Public Humanities Prize for her lifelong work to bring back preserve and teach the Penobscot language and her work um, to preserve and share Penobscot storytelling. And we're all invited to the award ceremony on April 7th. By the way, I will put the link to, re to register for that in the chat as well. Okay. This evening, Carol will generously share some stories and offer some Penobscot wisdom, which after all is what storytelling is for, offering wisdom, mm -hmm. in a presenta presentation called Otlogewe, Gewe, Otlogewe, which means appropriately, tell me a story. <laughs> um, 
and we will have time for discussion at the end. Welcome, Carol Atlogewe. Liwezi Galal Dani, New Jayao, Al Nabi Menahan. My name is Carol Dana. I'm from the People's Island. And I wanted to do a little background, I guess, of myself as a language person. Joe and had asked me if uh, we spoke the language in our family. We did, but it was very few words. And my grandmother, who was past Makwadi, would speak with her uh, friends in her home, in the kitchen there, and they would play board games and card games, you know, Pekino and things like that. And that all, be talking in their language. And if you knew my grandmother, she was quite stoic and uh, hard to tell what she's thinking or anything unless she was with her friends. And then they were laughing and talking and smiling. And I knew they were talking about me when I was little. And I, that's when the desire, my desire was born. I wanted to know what they were saying. And uh, I didn't realize how much uh, uh, influence she had on me until lately when, you know, I, I think back. So uh, let's see. Oh, I went to them when I was 15 and I asked her and my great aunt if they'd teach me some words because I liked a certain fella from Passamaquoddy. And I did go visit the elders on the island at the time. And I asked them, how did you come to know the language and they said by doing what you're doing we used to go visit the people you know and talk with them the elders and everything so I was starting to do that at age 15 and I went away to college in the Chias and uh, I ended up uh, at Peter Dana Point in 71 72 I married this man and of course it well it didn't uh work out, but I had my daughter. And uh, from there, I went to Akwesasne where I saw a living language. Now at Dana Point, everybody, every house you went to, they were speaking their language. And this is before a federal housing when they split people up, you know, elders and everything. And uh, it was immersion, really, immersion for me to be there. I was there almost a year, I think, before I left. And then living among the Mohawks in Akwesasne. They spoke their language every day. They had ceremonies in it and they prayed in it, you know, and I love their opening address, Thanksgiving address. So then I came home and uh, lived up Oak Hill. I had more children and that, that didn't work out either. Here I was, you know, uh, with all these children, I had the job of working with Frank Siebert, who devised a writing system for our language. And this was 1980. He had been around the island since the 1930s, uh, recording our language and devised that system with Andrew Dana. So my job was to type uh, from index cards entries in what would be the Penobscot Dictionary. And at that time, they had all these speakers around and I knew how they spoke and they may have been past Maquati, but they, I had the right sounds. You know what I mean? It's difficult to learn your language if you grew up speaking English and you don't have uh, the sounds and our writing system had a certain code to it. You know, like a K is a G and two Ks is a hard K sound and there's the alpha and people didn't like it. But it's because Penobscot had different sounds in it than English. Well, anyway, I worked there till 85 and I decided to go to college and finish because I wanted to teach Penobscot. <clears throat> so by the time I got done with college, there was a rule in that if you spoke your language, you didn't have to be a certified teacher in order to teach it, you could just teach it. But I'm glad that I went through college. I learned more about education and uh, you know different things. I had more exposure. Stephen Krashen was somebody I like to read about. He said, if you can read in the language, you can speak it. And uh, this is where I picked up my ability to read Penobscot and uh, I've been in it a long time. Frank gathered stories in volume one and volume two 
we had the transformer tales and speaking of colleges where I met Margo who does native literature and she was trying to get a group together to do some theater and everyone had great ideas but there was no follow through and I had that transformer tales from which this book uh, came from and it was told this man new alliance told these stories to Frank Speck in 1918, we wanted to get this published by 2018 because it would have been a hundred year, you know, anniversary. But as it turned out, it, you know, it just came out lately. But uh, Joanne asked me if uh, I knew Lisa Brooks, and uh, that came about. This book came about as a conversation between her and I, right here at the kitchen table, you know, talking about publishing. Uh, Somewhere we got the idea to republish the, the stories and that's what the book is. So that's my background and uh, how we got into this. So at the same time, around this time, we were talking about these things. National Park Service had money and they contacted Margo. Uh, they wanted to do something at Penobscot Theater, I guess because it's called Penobscot. And at the time her and I were talking, I said, let's do the Transformer Tales stories. All we have to do is script it up. And I said, we should do it in Penobscot. So that's what we did. And that was a great success. I think five uh, kids from here were in it, but a lot of non-native kids, children took part and it was great. You know, you have to learn your lines and that's what they did. So from there, we were off and running and publish these stories and you know uh, hope to do them around Maine or make it available for teachers too. But I'll start uh, with the first story and I'll read a little bit in Penobscot and then uh, we can do the other stories. I didn't talk about storytelling did I about the people from Old Lemon Island. There's islands we own 146 islands in the river that we retained and uh, our people lived up there hunting and trapping. And then when the state came around, they uh, restricted their hunting and trapping. You know, that was what, 1820. Uh, oh, this old man anyway told me at the time, this was in 1980s. He said, you and Barry are trying to turn back a uh, trend that started 60 years ago. So that would have been 1920s when the big wigs in the tribe went door to door and told everybody we need to work in town now. That's why they moved down here. The people that were upriver moved to the island and they were told, you know, we need to learn English and work in town now. And never mind making your baskets and all that. <clears throat> so that's when that happened. And Frank was there right around that time, writing down the language. Well, anyway, let's, let's just read some of it. Uh, the first one is about Gluskab. A lot of these stories are about his life and I need to tell you who he is. He's like a culture hero. It's no mistake that all of what he knows he learns from his grandmother because we revered elders, we revered grandmothers and usually the oldest woman capable uh, in the tribe was like, a, uh, she ran all the affairs of the family. She said who would even, who would marry who, you know, and uh, she worked in conjunction with the chiefs and that's how we ran the tribes. So uh, she's key in these stories. So Gartlogog and Guskabe, my story Guskabe, they lived there, Woodchuck and a grandson, Gluskabe, Wikijik, Manam Kwasu, Naga Wagwenasal, Gluskabe. She raised him and she taught him everything. Wamajaganam, Mezigeg, Weswadagaki, Man, how to hunt and also how to fish for fish. Eli Gadunkamak, Naga Eliat, Jamalat, Namasa, so that they could live. Wujich, Gizawasahitit. Eventually, Guskabi was big enough to be able to use a bow and arrows. And to his grandmother, he said, make me a bow and arrow. So I want to hunt deer. I am already tired of rabbit meat and fish. And I love that line. So, see you, Ottoman. 
well, you couldn't live on that anyway. You know, there's such a thing as rabbit starvation. So then he walked wandering and killed the deer. Ki Woodchuck was happy. She was very proud of her grandson. Again, when he walked wandering, then he killed the bear. When he arrived walking, he brought the bear on his back. Then he said to his grandmother, who is this? Awenawa. And notice he doesn't say, what is this? Who is this? And uh, Woodchuck jumped up from sitting and struck up a dance. She was so happy. Then she said to him, my grandchild, it's a great animal that you killed, a bear. So finally, now we live well. There is a lot of grease. We will eat well together. My grandchild is going to be very great in power. I think greatly of him. He will do good for our descendants as he goes on living because there are all kinds of danger seeking after them in the future. There are all kinds of animals seeking after them and also the rivers. He will be able to fix them so that they are not so dangerous. Then Glaskavi said to his grandmother, I want you to teach me how a canoe is built so that I will hunt ducks. Then Woodchuck said to him, for sure, I will teach you my grandchild. Then they built the canoe. Finally, they finished the canoe. Ki Glaskavi was happy. Right away, he set off by boat. Then he duck hunted, he got a lot of ducks. I think they say Mestaha, Mestaha zips. Eventually at one point, a lot of wind came up. He couldn't really paddle out into the water. So he walked wandering in the woods and he hunted. He thought evidently hunting is very slow. Then he walked back Then he started off to his house. So that's the first story in the we kind of watch Boscabi grow up. Uh, he does a lot of work. Well, he starts out uh, doing things his way that he thinks is an improvement on how things are. You know, he knows his grandmother struggles. So he uh, singing for a game bag of hair and then he keeps singing. So she made one a deer, she made one a moose and uh, he wasn't satisfied. He kept on singing. And uh, I guess this is a way to ask for something you want. So finally, she plucked hairs from a belly. And this was kind of like magical. You know, it was just right for him. And he went out. He told all the animals, the world is coming to an end. All you animals, get inside of my bag here and you'll be safe. So they all go in and he drags the bag back to his grandma and says, look, grandma, I've got all kinds of animals so we don't have to work so hard now hunting. And she looked at him, she says, at the Galela Gwynis, you haven't done well, my grandchild. What if our descendants don't have enough to eat? If we take all that we want and all that we can get, you know, and uh, she put him in touch with that. So he says, Golame uh, Nukamas, you speak the truth. And he let them all go out. He tells them, Majabazine, like you all go out, you know. And it kind of reminds me of that story of the Mitten and Norwegian story. Well, he goes out, he does the same thing to the fish, though. Uh, he builds a big weir, you know, he sees his grandmother there fishing and, uh, he tells the fish, the ocean's going to dry up, but if you come into my river, you'll be safe. After Sinkila, it won't dry up. And uh, so all the fish go in and they're all crowded out, you know, and he goes get his grandmother. Look what I've done, grandmother, you know. So you won't have such a hard time. And she doesn't approve again. She said, we can't have all the fish that we want for now. You know, you have to think of our descendants. So she kept saying, go Sezanawak. And Nagansozak uh, are our ancestors. Go Sezanawak are our descendants. So she's all the time telling them, think of those ones coming. You know, when we have that today, but not everyone is in touch with it. Uh, the decisions that you make today, you have to take into consideration the seven generations coming when you make a decision today, or you should have that in mind. So uh, he has some other exploits, you know, uh, 
she teaches him that. And then there's a grasshopper that has all this tobacco on the island. And she tells him he's a bad medallion, you know, like a sorceress, but he's not good. And uh, he's got all the tobacco and nobody else has any. So he goes, he said, I'm able to distribute it. So the uh, grasshopper's out on this island and he builds a canoe to get out there. And we have a measure to Gaga Bimuk is as far as you can see. And he tries the canoe uh, not once, but twice before it goes fur further enough that he gets out there and he makes a shaman's wish. Uh, can't remember how you say that now, but for the grasshopper to be gone. So when he gets out there, the grasshopper is gone. He goes in, he goes in his garden. He takes every bit of tobacco that he can find and takes it back for the people. And uh, then later on, the grasshopper comes paddling up and he's mad. He said, you took all my tobacco. He said, yes, I did, because you don't share it. You have so much, you can't even enjoy it. And he said, give me some seeds at least. And uh, Gustav says, I'll give you some uh, tobacco. And he splits his back, you know, when it makes uh, wings. That's how the grasshopper got uh, wings. And he said, gives he a best, and now you have your share. So that's why the, uh, <laughs> the grasshopper spits that tobacco out. That's what Gustav gave him. And uh, there's a number of stories in there, but it's in that book. You can get it on Amazon or... Uh, uh, Amherst College. This is uh, when he's heading off home, and then he headed off home. When he got there walking, Woodchuck was happy. Then Gustav said to her, well then now I have fixed it so that it will never again be so hard a winter. So I have finished working for our descendants. Now we'll move away to the end of our land. There we will live forever. We will still work for our descendants. I will always hear them if they ask me for help. Then it will be now, then I will be working there, making arrowheads. And maybe as the years go by, there is a great contest. And it said a war, but uh, our elder told us that that word doesn't mean war. It means a contest. And uh, those will be the ones our descendants use when they fight. So he's making arrowheads. And then Woodchuck said, well, then I will make lunches of, uh, well, Nima one is uh, dried corn and uh, dried deer meat. And they used to wear them on their belts if they had a journey that have these little pouches tied to their belt. And that's what they eat as they're going along. Now today, whenever he is told about in sacred stories, Gustav stops working for a moment. Then he raises his head and laughs. Then he says, yes, our descendants still remember me. And it's Esquide. He says, aha, Esquide, Namika, Gawidaham, Gusazanawak. And that's why we named the book that uh, still they remember me because those were his words at the end. But it's really uh, good stories in there. There's other adventures and uh, uh, somewhere I had read, if you want to know people, study their folklore, you know, so that's uh, from our people and how they, uh, the whole thing about storytelling was with the children there, that's how they learned our culture, values and ways. So since we had done this, I used to make some food up and invite people over and they'd come in and mostly it was women and uh, would tell stories. And I did get my grandson in here once. I don't know why he was like, so avoiding us, you know, it was a good time and uh, we had a good time and then COVID hit. So uh, somewhere too, I read that our stories are a cosmogony. It's like what fuels your universe. And like Frank said, these stories had to be told even if they were told the year before. So it's part of our tradition and uh, I'd like to see it come back. I know they do some storytelling from uh, Nabizan and the two other guys and I were doing it on Zoom for a while. And I like it because these men are fluent in their language. They can just 
you know, go on a story and uh, me, I have to read it. I mean, I remember some words here and there, but it's not like I have the whole thing memorized in the language. I've tried doing that, it's difficult. Uh, there is one I like, uh, I think we have time for this, about Madal and uh, shamans. They're at Pushaw and it said they like to make themselves disappear when they're about to be defeated. So, they jump in the water and they turn around and when they come out, they're a beaver. Another one jumps in and he turns around and comes out, he's a muskrat. Another one jumps in, turns around and comes out, uh, a loon. Another one is a mink and uh, I think that's all of them. But my teacher, uh, because I had gone to immersion at St. Thomas, I mean, St. Mary's, and it was sponsored by St. Thomas. She said, story is the basket in which we carry our language. And in that story, it goes like, uh, and she got him. Uh, so it's got that uh, same words over and over and you do learn it, you know, that's, I think that's why I love that story so much. But, uh, that's a little bit. Uh, the other thing I did, I went to the Raymond Fogler Library on campus and I found 200 stories in there that I researched and I've got them. And uh, there's more in there, there's got to be, because I just did it, you know, and then I stopped. So there's a lot of stories in there about us. But I'll stop here if anybody has any questions or comments or anything they'd like to say. There's two in the chat. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to know what questions people might have. Um, I there are no questions in the chat yet. I did put oh. up the the name of your book, though. Still, yeah. they remember me and the information about that, which is quite a wonderful thing. Um, and maybe I will. I will start off by asking you a question. And as I do that, I would encourage anybody else either to write a question in the chat or. If you look down at the bottom of your page, you'll see um, something that says reactions on your screen. Mm -hmm. And if you click on reactions, you can raise your hand and you will come up and I will know uh, that you're there and we'll get your question. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Mm -hmm. But I will start off here. Um, I'd like to ask um, about the work that you do. I understand that you do some work with elders at this point. Um, and I wonder if you use stories or language work with the elders that you work with. Well, not right now. I do a Zoom language. And uh, again, there's mostly women, uh, but I haven't worked with the elders because of COVID. I did uh -huh. go next door. See, we're in the same building as the uh, assisted living. And I used to go over there and tell them stories. But since COVID, we haven't been able to do that. And they enjoy it and they miss it. So I told them I'm on Bangor Public Library and uh, they, they don't know how to hook the, uh, like they could get on Zoom and get it on the television, but I guess nobody down there knows how to do it because a couple <laughs> of them were really wanting the stories and they could have just tuned in to it, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. But I don't know what they have, but that's uh, when I work with the elders and I work with the daycare staff too, uh, right. teaching them the language. And I wrote 25 songs in Penobscot and I'm trying to get those done on a CD for Naomi. She wants that for her daycare. I've See. had great fun in the air. I love singing with the kids. It makes me happy. You know, so I really miss them, but we're going to stay on Zoom for now. 
May I ask you a question about the the stories, the characters in the stories? Mm -hmm. I notice you pointed out that that Guscape says to his grandmother Woodchuck, or she says to him, um, oh, "Who is this?" Yes. When she's referring to a bear, could you comment a little bit more on that? Who? Yeah, we've been uh, kind of accenting that, you know, because in other stories there's a big frog holding the water back. And when he lets it go, the people were so happy they jumped in the water. Well, some of them stayed in there and they became uh, frogs, fish and turtles. And that was their clan. That's how our clan started. So those were our relatives in the same way with you know the animals, we have great respect for them. Oh, so if you're talking Penobscot, you would say awenawa because that's animate. The whole language is divided into animate and inanimate. And we don't know why uh, Connor thinks that linguists did that, but they didn't because that's the way the people spoke. So that's why it's awenawa, who is it? Instead of gegwini, what is it? And uh, they call each other, well, this is his grandmother, but they call other people uh, like Nukamus, Musums, grandmother, grandfather, uncle. It's a term of respect and it's almost like an endearment. You know, my daughter, we still do that today, does, you know, if you want to uh, address a young uh, girl, you, you would call her does, my daughter, and then you would say what you want to say. And that's the only thing that survived from that. But there was an old woman when I was a little girl, I noticed I had little turquoise rings on and I had a little bracelet and she was a friend of the family's. And that was from her, her gifts to me as a baby. And uh, she told me one day, you can call me auntie, but I don't think we were blood related, but it's because of the relationship we had my folks and, and her and her husband. And he was a great one for Frank Sieber for language, my boss. He learned a lot from him. You told me it was Frank Sieber who actually applied alphabets and writing to Penobscot. Is that yes. right? Yes. Yeah. So they, Penobscot as a written language is about what, 50 years old? Uh, this was in 19... 20 when he started oh, it's 20 to 30s yeah yeah uh what was i gonna say about that when you were talking about the alphabets oh it's based on the international phonetic system yeah uh, yeah i see i see and i get it you know i don't know i took to it like a duck to water you know the letters, the sounds, I go, this is true to the language, you know, from what I could see. And uh, I just mm -hmm. took to it. And I'm so uh, blessed, so grateful uh, for this, you know. But sometimes it's burdensome too <laughs> to think. I used to think that I had to bring the language back. And then I read somewhere, you can't convey language to somebody. You know, they have to put in their own effort in their own time. But I was fortunate to be around in the 80s and to have a grandmother and hear the language there at a young age too. You know, I've been listening around all my life. I was born in 1952. And then in the 60s, people were saying, you know, you should be praying in your language because creator will really hear you. And that's how I got my start. I devised a prayer. And I would say that prayer and people would ask me to pray for them and, you know, uh, that's how I started uh, coming out with the language because even in the 80s, I wasn't ready. I hold myself back. I don't know why. Uh, my teacher, the one who taught me basketry and language, one day we were at coffee clutch and she said, Musa Wugawida has he got some gypped in Tuazamodi. And I understood her. She said, Don't forget to take your cup. It took me a month to be able to say that back to her, you know. So wow. it's, it's a process. Yeah. So I've and an on... important one. It, yeah. I just want to say if, if anybody has a question, just raise your hand, wave, or if you're behind a, 
a screen, um, click the the raise hand under reactions down at the bottom of your screen. I don't need. Yes, Joseph. Unmute yourself and ask your question. OK, I have a question. I'm, um, I have a little shop. And a number of years ago, a man came to my shop from North Conway. His name was Stephen Laurent. Oh, and really? Do you know him? Yeah, well, I know he's, I know of his writing. Well, his father wrote an uh, Wabanaki English dictionary, he yeah. told me. It was Joseph one of the first Smith? ones. Uh -huh. uh, does he, he still live in Bell's Hollows? He lived somewhere near Odenak. Oh, um, okay. And he told me that he used to travel from, from Canada to the Interville in North Conway every summer with his father. And oh, they had a shop there. Okay. And then they would travel back um in the fall when when the tourist season was over but oh. he told me about his father's dictionary i've never seen it but he said yeah. it was one of the first wabanaki english english wabanaki dictionaries yes you know they're closer to us than uh well i feel they are in language than um analyses or past maquatis and uh, there was a couple that would come up to our language gatherings, and I was always so happy to see them because the other tribes that kind of make fun of us, you know, uh, how we talk and we're trying, you know, they made fun of us before when we didn't have a language. And now that we're trying they make fun of us again. Huh. And uh, Somebody said, if the Indians like you, they'll tease you and they'll make funny, but I get mad at them, you know. <laughs> I'll, I kind of clam up, you know, but uh, I guess it's all good. You just have to not be so serious. But mm -hmm. they said if they like you, they'll tease you. Hmm. <laughs> that's that's true a lot, isn't it? In in many cultures, if you yeah. if you're worth a, if you're worth teasing, then you belong. Somehow. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know that though. I'm like oh, they make me mad, but yeah, I read Joseph Laurent. I have uh, Gordon Day's book, Joseph Laurent. It was so interesting doing this book because Connor Quinn, I'm telling you, he's a genius in language. I got to see his process. Uh, he'd see a word and he'd say, well, I've never seen that one before, but let me do this. And he'd look in the Abenaki dictionaries and he'd find that word and he'd say, yeah, here it is. You know, this is, this is uh, like that word. In, uh, it was so neat for me to see his process. Uh, what else did he use? Uh, Vetramie has a dictionary, Gordon Day, Laurent. Seemed like there was somebody else too, but yeah, he used all those. Cause see, they're close to us. They're closer to us than the others. Hmm. Hmm. Well, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, um, Pippi or Peter. Hi, I was just curious. It was wonderful to listen to you. I, I was curious whether there are still um, stories or songs or prayers or pieces of folklore in circulation that have not yet been written down or transcribed. Is, is there? Yeah. work to be done there and just and to yeah. continue to collect yes yeah, so our volume two will be stories frank speck collected but had written in english and connor quinn mcdonough the man i mentioned well connor mcdonough quinn he'll uh, he's already translated those into frank's uh, written system the one I worked with on the dictionary. So that was a big find. Margot found them. She went down to uh, American Philosophical Society there. She's from Philadelphia too. All these guys are from Philadelphia. She found these stories and we're like, wow, what a treasure. We didn't know we had those stories. And it's just been a blessing. So that's volume two. And then in Transformer Tales, there's other stories that are quite long about Guanawas and Bitas. So we're thinking of putting them together and make them a graphic novel type thing. Ah. Yeah, yeah. 
that will draw in more people too more, right. more young people uh, will like those uh, like comic books somebody said it sounds like a fancy word for comic book but uh, <laughs> you know it'll be good yeah yes. so, so who is telling penobscot stories now where well, are they being told john bear mitchell uh has been doing this for some time and he's got traditional stories his family uh maintained and he does this uh i do i don't know other people that you know are out doing it really i'm trying to maintain our tradition around it too by doing it in the winter and i put tobacco out before tonight uh they say to give tobacco to those beings that are in the story before you tell them to. Mm. But he's the only other one I know that does it. I mean, the guys, they're always got hunting stories, you know, and things like that. Those are the kind of stories I heard growing up, just adults talking, you know, but it wasn't like, okay, now this is story time and we're all gonna sit down and do this. It was just something that happened, impromptu type things. Well, it seems so poignant now to, to, to hear you say everything we decide to do has to do with seven generations of our descendants, what mm -hmm. protecting them, because of course we are living in a world where we have not, we, not you, we have not protected our descendants for seven generations and we're looking at, at uh, disaster as a result. Yeah. I wonder if you can think of other kinds of wisdom that those stories offer nowadays that would be particularly important for people. Well, they're about environment. I don't know, my friend Trevanian said the the world needs these stories it's mostly about well how you treat people uh Gustav is said to be a trickster and he tries to make things happen by manipulating you know and then he ends up uh talking it out like negotiating like with the wind bird uh he's trying to hunt the ducks right well yeah. Tell, tell the story of the wind eagle. That that's a good story. Tell yeah. us about that story. Yeah, I was starting to uh his grandmother, he, he asked his grandmother, where is the wind? And she says, Oh, now what do gag when us? It's a long ways off. He said, Well, I will find it. And he goes on his journey and he's walking and walking, and the wind is blowing, it blows all his hair off. Suddenly he sees this giant bird on the hilltop and he goes over to him, Quay, grandfather, he said, uh, wouldn't it be better if you were way over there on that hilltop with, you know, making the wind? And that isn't what he wanted, but he that's what he tells him. And uh, he said, no, I can't go there, Gwyneth. I've been here since the beginning of time. And he said, well, I will help you. So he carries him over there and trips and falls and grandfather falls in a crevice. And he leaves him there. He goes back. He says, now it'll be good hunting, right? Well, after a while, he couldn't even get his paddle in the water. The water was so scummy. And he thought about it. He said, I've got to go back to see him. And uh, so he makes the journey back, finds him laying, you know, there. And uh, grandfather, what happened to you? He said, oh, this ugly bald man came and dropped me and left me here. And, you know, by then Gustav's hair grew back and didn't know it was him. Well, I will heal you, grandfather. I will heal your wing and I'll take you back over there where you were. And that's what he does. And uh, as he's, you know, getting him to his perch there, he said, uh, well, from now on, couldn't be that you don't blow so much wind could it be that you flap for a day but then take a rest and he said I could do that Gwyneth so he ends up talking it out with him and you know and, and then all is well <laughs> so it's just uh, different things that happen and uh, it shows our values like with the grasshopper uh I think that's about distribution of what you have and not hoarding and keeping everything for yourself too. 
Because sometimes the opposite of what the story is, is the value. You know, with Uncle Turtle too, there's other stories there about Uncle Turtle and the humorous, you know. Guscavi, when he's young, he makes a whole lot of mistakes that are about being greedy or all that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But when he gets older, does he get wiser? Yeah, because he teaches the same lesson to the grasshopper that his grandmother just told him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about there was a story about the maple maple syrup. Do you know that one? Uh, more Iroquoian, uh, where they were all drinking all the maple syrup and nothing was getting done. They were laying about drinking maple syrup. So Guscabi said he had to do something about that. So he made it this whole big process they had to do. <laughs> well, I guess it is an Iroquois story if it was Guscabi, but he changed the way maple syrup was made because you had to put more work into it. And cook mm. it, gather it, and uh, I watched somebody paddling it the other day, and uh, they take all the moisture out, and it's just sugar, it's just maple sugar. They had it's a, a big, wood, yeah, a big wooden tray with a paddle, and they're all the time working that. So it's about about not having life too easy, so that you will do work. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Well, that was our life year round. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's something else. Do you, is there a reason why, um, why Guscave's grandmother is a woodchuck? Um, that I don't know. No. I always wondered about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I just know the grandmother is the one with all the knowledge and help and looking after things. She's a model of generosity, isn't she? And she didn't you say she pulls all the hair off her belly to yeah. make him a bag? Yeah. yeah. That's an uncomfortable thing. I know. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. so into the stories. I was driving by the police station one day and I saw this beautiful woodchuck side of the road. And I I don't know why I went in to see them. I said, I want to take that woodchuck and skin it out and I did and I put it on a wreath wire you know a round one and I strung it all up it's so beautiful I tried what did I put on it bear grease and anyway it got real paper thin and the wind kept blowing it down but it's right outside my door so I just touch it now and then thinking of grandma woodchuck mm. it's just beautiful kind of reddish brown yeah. Those stories, all of those stories, it seems to me the way you tell them and that they turn the whole the whole world into a textbook. You know, you see a woodchuck and then you think about all the things Grandma Woodchuck did and oh, you see yeah. the bear and the stories yeah. were there. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, what used to impress me when I was in college, I read about the Cree who could read the tops of trees. And this is them coming home in a canoe at dusk. And the, you know how the tree, the pattern, the line of the tree, how they went, they could read that. So they'd know where they are. Mm. Yeah, and something about the rods in our eyes. Ours are more in tune with the lines going up and down and theirs went another way. So there was, few things in there that would get my attention you know uh, the yeah. people had so much so much on board you know about uh nature i'm reading a book now it's a cree a, med a man he's cree he has a medicine bundle and he's in saskatchewan and he's talking about all these plants and we have the same plants here the same ones He's talking about that he's using to treat people out there, but saying he has to go out further to get it because, you know, when oil goes in, they make those long, uh, I don't know what you call them. You know, like if they're cutting down for, for 
lines for wires. They're cutting all that growth down. And mm -hmm. he has to go out further and further to get the medicine, you know, the ones he needs. And he's just got an interest in uh, perspective. The more I read him, the, you know, the more I like it. Mm. Russ, Russ Willier is his name. You were talking about the, the distinction in the language between things that are animate and things that are inanimate. Yeah. Tell, tell me about where trees go in that. Well, a buzzik, a buzzil, if it's inanimate, they're talking about bushes and a buzzyug are the trees. So that- And, they're, and trees are animate? Yeah, yeah. Huh. But if you say a buzzyul, it's you're talking about the little switches, the little bushes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. Well, let me ask if anyone else has any more questions you'd like to ask for Carol. Or Carol, if there's anything you'd like to leave us with before we before we go off, I've just put the uh, link to the evaluation in the chat. If you would all click on that. Yeah, Pippi, there you've got a question. Um, yes, I was just wondering about the songs that you wrote for young children. Yeah and what those songs are about. Oh, I translated Twinkle Twinkle. <laughs> uh, another one was all around the mulberry bush, like Neo <laughs> Ali, Nuskohosie Egg, Nuskohosie Egg, Nuskohosie Egg. Like this is the way we comb my hair early in the morning. And I had to tell them, we used to wash clothes on that washboard. So we go Neo Ellie. The stockany gag, you know, like this, but I had to explain it all out because nobody's seen them, right? I used to use them. <laughs> so Frank, in fact, my boss uh, made that song up and uh, he taught me and I told him we'd have the kids sing it to him one day. He said, I don't want nobody singing to me. But I always think of him, yeah. Uh, canoe song is one of our traditional songs, but it's to sing when you're afraid of the waves. You're scared, mm -hmm. you sing that song, but it has a common effect on the children. What's so it like? It's what? just yo he yo yo ha yo he yo yo ha yo he yo yo ha. And I get the feeling of a wave going yes. up and down. Mm -hmm. Your voice goes up, then it goes down, and it's very common. Mm. Yeah. And, I don't know, I just wrote some other ones up. Uh, Mesla Begasses is, uh, oh, yeah. Spider, went up the water spout. Oh, <laughs> it's it's spider. Yeah. yeah, yeah. My granddaughter loves that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I wrote him down. Oh, she'll be coming around the mountain because I had a friend that lived up in uh, Alder Stream with their girlfriend and they used to, hunt moose and try to live off the land and you know all this stuff well her grandson would say grandma's coming today because he could smell her could tell his mother and he was right every time and then they'd all start singing she'll be coming around the mountain <laughs> so i translated that into penobscot uh, but uh I was asking Connor some of the words because I had Passamaquoddy, you know, if I can't think of it in Penobscot, I'll use Passamaquoddy. He goes, you've been working on that song for 20 years now. <laughs> <laughs> I had to finesse it, you know, cause I'm gonna record it. Yeah, just oh, fun things like that, yeah. That, that would be like, fun. Did you yeah. ever make a recording of, of those songs for children? I'm going to, I got to get down to the IMRC uh, center on UMO and uh, Naomi will pay for it. She's the one that wants a CD and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Margo's going to hook me up with Dwayne Shimley down there. That's a wonderful project for kids for language learning. I don't know if you ever met Michael Parent. He's a Franco-American storyteller from Lewiston. He made a he made a recording of uh, French children's songs that he also translated into English. So he had French and English versions of them. 
Oh, um, good. And kids, I can I can send you some stuff about that if you're interested. Yeah, well, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, Bonnie Baruby used to be around. And they were talking about second language learning. So I guess I had this idea way back. See, Penobscot's our mother tongue, but it's our second language now. So I always figured second language learning techniques would help us. And I did find somebody on campus I could talk to, and we used to talk quite a bit. And it helped me in my approach, you know, like tell a story in English first so they know what's going on and then tell it in Penobscot. And with the songs, it's easier sometimes to sing those words. But some of the people's eyes bug out when they hear me uh, singing it, like, uh, it's, which go we la we we ni wa jo be ji la. And uh, to say we're having chicken and dumplings, something like a hem, but a kwini ganak be ji la. You know, it's a mouthful. <laughs> But it's fun. I find it fun. And, you know, people, I think, find it difficult. I know it, it can be real difficult, but you just got to play. You got to have fun. That's what kids do, right? Yeah. yeah. And to weave that into language, that's really beautiful. I love the way you were weaving some Penobscot into the stories that you were sharing with us earlier. Yeah, because it'll be just a phrase that I remember, you know, that was meaningful to me. Uh, my favorite one is he's going off on one of his trips and he tells grandmother, don't worry. He says, Musa Sahigach, you know, when I worry and I know I'm like that. So Margot knows that phrase now. She'll tell me sometimes, Musa Sahigach. And it's so comforting to hear that in your own language, you know, somebody telling you, like reassuring you, don't worry, you know. Wow, yeah. well, that seems like a pretty good uh, hope for our future. And maybe that's a good place to leave this. Yeah. It's a great pleasure to have been been with you, Carol. And thank Me you too. for sharing so yeah. much with us. I, I really appreciate it. And thank you on behalf of the library and, mm -hmm. Well, we've only got four more days to tell stories, but um, yeah. <laughs> well, this is telling them. you can only tell them in the winter, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. It's been fun.